Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Today, our guest is Ash Fontana, one of the leading investors in artificial intelligence and author of the AI First Company. Ash, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. And um, Ash is also an avid bike rider who already rode 90 miles today. So uh, this is a guy who's in really great shape. Can you uh, tell us about your professional background? Sure. Um, I've been investing primarily for most of my life. I really like practicing the craft of investing, of really going deep into the products that companies make and then how companies sort of turn that into something really substantial and sustainable um, and how the company is a vehicle for change in the world. Um, so I've been doing that for most of my life. I've done that at various stages, later stages, earlier stages, public markets, private markets. But, you know, simultaneously, I've also been messing around with computers for quite a while, you know, back in the sort of first era of the web, starting websites um, and then starting other companies in the, in the mobile and social era um, and then working on other startups myself. So um, I've done a little bit of both investing in and starting companies, um, you know, work for some big banks, work for some small companies. Uh, across the spectrum and you know right now I uh, my day job is investing and then last year when there was not that much else to do on my nights and weekends I wrote a book and that's what we're excited about uh, today by the way what, what was your most successful investment that you've made uh, um, at this point it's probably an investment I made almost 10 years ago in a company called Canva, uh, which makes tools to help people communicate and be more creative. Um, so that's, that's probably the most. They were just named top three cloud company in the world yesterday. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Congratulations. Why did you write this book? And, and I'm glad you did because this is such a topic that all of us are interested in. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think there was... a. a point in time really which is you know a couple of when I started writing this book where everyone gets that AI is important everyone gets that it's transformational everyone gets that it's in, that it's going to impact many industries but there is very little information on how to bring it into the real world and so if you think about a lot of the existing books out there a lot of them are on one end of the spectrum being like quite philosophical and thinking about the future implications of artificial intelligence which of course are very important to think about and on the other end of the spectrum you've got books that are more about how to actually program these systems um, which of course is also very important to actually build these things and not just talk about building them so you've got books at both ends of the spectrum but sort of what was missing in the middle was something that was a bit more pragmatic and sort of explained, okay, you might not be a programmer, you might not be too concerned or um, you know, be able to contribute to the conversation about what might happen 50 years from now. You might just want to sort of put it into action today in your business. And there weren't many books out there or really any books out there about that. There's sort of some on the fringes. And so that's, that's why I wrote it, um, to contribute that knowledge to the world because I... I believe that just contributing knowledge is a morally good thing to do. Yeah, you know, we had somebody, I'm forgetting the author, and he also wrote a book on AI. He said of the AI lab at MIT, and mm. he said, think about it, for $25, you're mm. getting 1,000 hours of my work for $25. Mm -hmm. So he said, my gosh, um, who would not want to have all of that knowledge that you could get. So that's the beauty of books. And that's why I happen to love having uh, you authors on my show and why people love mm. to listen to it. Um, what were you hoping more readers will get out of it? And why this particular title? Yeah, I want to key off what you were just saying, which is um, the sort of posterity and utility of books as a format. And I'm really glad you're supporting authors of business books because you know, in today's world, it's very easy to publish a post or like a blog post or do it like a very short interview or something like that 
or write a tweet even. But putting all of the knowledge in one place actually just makes it a lot easier for someone to use that knowledge. The, the utility of it is, is much, much greater because you can then have it next to you when you're in your job day to day. And that gets to your question here, which is, you know, what I hope readers get out of it is something they can apply in their job, you know, whether they are a manager of a very small team in their company and want to sort of work with that team to launch an initiative about using AI to improve something in their, in their company, um, whether they have a family business and they want to improve a process or like take the business to the next level, or whether they're starting a company, you know, I hope there's something in there for everyone in terms of, you know, a framework they can use to analyze how they should make a decision about what product to build or, you know, a, a, a table that they can work through when they're thinking about who they might want to hire for their business or some ideas when they're thinking about how they might want to price their product. So the book is sort of designed with lots of tables and frameworks and illustrations so that you can sort of pick and choose what might be applicable at any given moment in your role. Um, and again, whether you're at a big company, a small company, whether you're senior or junior, whether it's a move that you're looking to make to transform a business or transform your career, you know, it's designed so people can pick and choose things um, based on where they're at. What is the definition of an AI first company? Yeah, very good question. Um, <laughs> it's annoyingly recursive, um, but the, in that it's about putting AI first. Um, but where, like, what does that really mean? It's about putting AI first in every conversation, you know, conversations about product strategy, what should we build? Um, conversations about pricing, how should we price it? Conversations about people, who should we hire? Um, conversations about policy, what must we consider in terms of regulations? You know, having someone in the room that asks questions with an AI lens, like AI first mindset, actually changes the decisions that are made in those conversations or in those meetings. For example, you know, thinking about what people to hire, you might want to hire people that are very able, very, very, very facile um, with data, have lots of skills around managing data. When thinking about pricing, you might want to think about, well, let's price this product so we actually get more usage of it so we get more data so we can train our systems better rather than just to extract the most value out of it um, the most quickly um, when thinking about policy you know an ai first company will be very considerate of a lot of the regulations around how to manage data so it's about putting ai first in those conversations and people that have read the book um, are going to have i think the vocabulary to do that and to be that person in the room that's asking those questions. Yeah, and I mean, today, no matter what size of company you're at, at you really need to know about AI and how that's going to mm -hmm. fit into your overall strategy and how you're going to develop mm -hmm. a strategic advantage. What are the myths that need to be dispelled about AI? <laughs> Quite a few. Uh, it's hard to know where to start. I guess I'll start at the low level. Um, a lot of people think you need lots of data to get started with AI. You know, that might be true for some things. You know, for example, recognizing something in an image, you might need lots of images to train an AI-based system to recognize an object in an image, a traffic light, a, a type of car or something like that. Um, but with lots of methods, you don't actually need a lot of data to get started. They actually work on work quite well in terms of we're able to extrapolate something, a trend, make a prediction from very small data sets. So that's one big myth. Another big myth is, you know, you need huge cloud-based systems. The reality is um, a lot of data science experiments are just done on laptops, like individuals' laptops. And you don't actually need, you know, huge cloud-based systems to run models thousands and thousands of times per hour or per minute. Um, you might need that eventually if you're going to scale out the AI system to deliver predictions in real time all the time, like Uber does, for example, with trips and trip lengths. They certainly need a big system like that. But if you're just looking to, you know, make a prediction 
about something on a less regular basis or you've got a model that's already pretty accurate, you don't need one of those systems. You can actually run it on like quite small, cheap to run computers. Um, and then another big myth is that you need lots of scientists, you know, with very specialized skills in AI. And the reality is a lot of the skills required to build models and to do data science um, can be um, learned in many different disciplines. You know, a lot of people who work at your company already may have those skills. A lot of them are just around statistics and like being generally pretty good with numbers and statistics and mathematics. Um, and it's not often the case that you need to have like highly specialized training in machine learning to work with AI. So I can go on, but I think there are three really fundamental myths that you need a lot of data, um, you need a really big cloud-based computing system or you need a lot of scientists with specialized skills in machine learning to get started with AI. And, you know, often, sometimes, but often that's just not the case. Uh, what, what are the competitive advantages of using AI? Mm. So one way I think about this, I think about this in lots of different ways, but is on the demand side and on the supply side. So let's talk about the demand side first. If you're thinking about the demand for your product, you sell t-shirts, for example. One of the advantages of using AI is you can develop a predictive ability um, around what might sell next season, what colors, what sizes, what styles, what, that sort of thing. And you know, if you are able to make that prediction, you're gonna be able to deliver what the market wants and probably sell more. So you're getting, being able to predict demand is you know, one competitive advantage it can give you and that manifests itself in more revenue quite simply. Now on the other side, um, you think about the cost side of things, AI can help you automate things and reduce costs, automate you know, a step in a production process or something that you do every month at the end of the month, a reconciliation, accounting reconciliation that takes up a lot of time and money. And that can help you ultimately supply what you're supplying your customers at a lower cost because you've automated one of the things that goes into that. Um, so they're the very straightforward competitive advantages. You, know, it, you can see around the corner and predict demand, make more money, um, or you can automate something and lower costs and sell at a lower price. They're the basic ones. Um, you know, the book, of course, goes into a lot more detail around the new type of competitive advantage that's offered by AI. Um, but that's you know, quite an involved consideration and that's you know, what the whole first chapter is about. Um, but they're the basic ones. Uh, one of the questions from the audience is, how do you manage the transition from human decision-making to trusting AI results? It's a really, really good question. Um, so I will say in some instances, it's, it's fairly easy, right? You know, if you have a very well-defined thing that you're trying to identify and the model's pretty accurate out of the gate and the cost of getting it wrong is not too high, then you can probably just trust it out of the gate. But, you know, it's often the case that the model won't be extremely accurate from day one or more accurate than humans. And the cost of getting it wrong might be... Um, not insignificant you know you might uh have a model that's trying to predict when to turn on or off a machine on a production line and turning off a machine and stopping the production line for 10 minutes you know costs a lot of money so you want to make sure when when the ai system is making that decision to turn off a production line to avoid a, an error or a quality problem or something like that that it's a good one um and so it's usually a case of sort of gradually then suddenly um really relying on AI and trusting AI, as in you have a human in, in a loop, so to speak, either just checking the predictions, checking the output, seeing if it's right, or correcting things. So, okay, you predicted that there might be this error, but actually I've got a lot of experience in this and I'm, I'm, that's actually an incorrect prediction. And then it incorporates that into its next sort of um, training run, as in its next, way, its next, um, rerun of the model um, to improve its accuracy next time. And then ultimately, you know, you can ideally step back. Um, but there are lots of different sub-technologies available um, and different features of AI-first products that allow humans to be involved in the process. Um, it just really depends on, 
you know, what your accuracy thresholds are, what the end use is and how accurate it is out of the box. I mean, I would assume anybody would want 100% accuracy or the minimum in the high 90s. What, what would it be worth if you didn't have that kind of high accuracy? I mean, you could make significant mistakes, right? Uh, I've got to disagree there. I mean, Tell we're me. not accurate when we make decisions 100% of the time. In fact, we're often far, far below that. You know, whether it's a decision about um, <laughs> like something that we're, we're very bad at, um, like predicting demand, or whether it's a decision that involves incorporating a huge amount of data, um, or whether it's a decision about, you know, the functioning of a very complex system, like a weather report, you know, humans have no hope at making those decisions with any semblance of accuracy, but intelligent systems that run on computers can. So, you know, a lot of the time, I guess, to reframe this, you know, the benchmark is, well, how accurate is the human involved? And even sometimes that's not even the benchmark because you know, sometimes either a human can't make a decision or it's just cost prohibitive for a human to make a decision over and over and over again. Um, so for example, it's cost prohibitive in, uh, to take a toy example, in an autonomous car to have it, you know, the whole point of an autonomous car is there's no human there, but to have a human there, you know, pressing the accelerator and, and the brake pedal every single time, that's not the point. Um, and so you, and we, we make lots of mistakes in cars as well. That's another good example of, you know, where we don't have 100% accuracy ourselves. So it, it's not the case. Now, to your point though, in a lot of use cases, so for example, in the medical field, you do want very, very high accuracy. Again, doctors aren't perfect, but the consequences of being imperfect are very high. So you um, you might want to want that level of accuracy in some cases, but in a lot of cases, no. Can we hire, I guess we hold technology to a higher standard. Like it mm. either it's perfect or it's imperfect. And mm. so if we don't get that 100% accuracy, whatever mm -hmm. that is, then we think it's kind of failed, even mm -hmm. though it could be 90 some percent in, in the United States. Uh, Moneyball is a book written about baseball and how they use statistics and probably a lot of AI in terms of determining who they draft in the baseball mm -hmm. draft and what players they sign and how much they mm -hmm. sign them for and so forth. And it's still humans inputting the information. Is that where some of the inaccuracy comes in is, you know, whoever's inputting that information? Yeah, it can. That's a very good point. And a lot of the design of AI first products um, can actually focus on that problem, which is how do we get really good input back from the humans? How do we get them to like very precisely outline the thing that they're trying to recognize in an image? Or how do we get them to very definitively say this prediction was right or wrong? Or how do we get them to take their knowledge about the functioning of something like um, a kidney or a liver and say, you know, when this happens and this is also there and this symptom is there and something else happens and I see this level in the blood, then we know that it's this condition and taking that knowledge out of a human's head and putting it into a program can be a very lengthy, arduous process. But the thing is, if you can do it and get it right, then you can very reliably make a decision over and over and over again, sort of while you sleep because the computer's doing it. So it's a very, very good point. And, you know, to one of your questions before, in a way, this is one of the most underappreciated things about the design of these AI first products is just how careful you have to be with the human input process. And, you know, that's not just a cause for error, but it's also, um, a way to ensure you develop a really, really good product. I mean, put another way, it's not the case that AIs can understand the core mechanics behind a lot of things just straight out of the box. They can in some cases, but you know, they can't just predict the weather by throwing a whole bunch of random data sets at it and figuring out um, you know, if it's gonna rain tomorrow or not. Usually they involve a human to say, all right, here's a whole bunch of data sure try and spot some patterns around like when it might rain and when it might not but we also know that you know um water vapor collects in the atmosphere to a certain point and then it rains and so you, you encode that that information in or that knowledge into the model um 
So it's, it's a very, very important step and it's a real source of advantage if you can get the people that really understand a domain to properly input their knowledge into a system. Because yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about whoever's putting it at typing in the keystrokes. One of the questions yeah. from the audience is, do you know of any examples of AI which have improved the learning outcomes for people on the autism, neuro, uh, neuro, neurodiverse, uh, these communities need needs personalization of solutions at scale. Yeah. Um, so I am aware of some very, very good work going on there around personalized learning for people in general, but also people with specific conditions, um, you know, whether those conditions affect learning or not. And there is some excellent, excellent work there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to spend a lot of time in the sort of education technology space. It's not an area where I've developed a lot of expertise personally. Um, but yes, I mean, if you think about it in a general sense, if you've got, you know, a, uh, a, a system that can guide someone through a mathematics problem or guide someone through a language learning exercise, and it constantly sees where people get stuck, you know, it can learn that and sort of suggest a different way to learn it or represent re-represent the problem um, to, to the person who's trying to learn. So you can think conceptually like how you might have a self-learning system that would help people find different ways to learn and help them through various exercises. And uh, th there are some people working on that. Uh, there's another question from the audience. Do you think creative thinking and complex decision-making can be automated one day through AI? I, uh, it's a good question because I, I don't really. Um, now, of course, that depends on the definition of creative and complex. You know, AIs can be very creative. They can do things like um, we've seen in, in the press in mostly about a year or two ago, things like um, paint something in the style of name an artist. Um, so they can, they can do various things, and I won't go into how, that sort of result in a whole new um, creation. Um, and they can also do things that make decisions under, you know, a lot of uncertainty, like weather predictions. Um, but, you know, when we mostly think about creative tasks, like representing information in a different way or writing books, things like that. And when we mostly think about complex decision-making, like, understanding the functioning biological system in diagnosing a medical condition. The problem is we don't really have an objective when we undergo those things as humans, when we under, undertake a creative task or undertake to make a decision in a complex environment or you know, within a complex system like a biological or environmental system. So we don't have an objective and we somehow sort of figure out our way through it. We sense our way through it mostly. And the thing is, AIs can't do that because one, they often have limited senses and two, they um, often can't integrate a lot of the information from those senses as well as we can in parallel. That's the thing, like AIs are very good at doing the same thing over and over again quickly. Humans are very good about at doing different things slowly, but in massive degrees of parallelism, like incorporating sight and vision and all these different senses all at once. Um, so they're not really, AIs are just not really good at those things because without an objective and without, you know, a, a whole bunch of sensory in, input, they can't, they've got nothing to work with and nothing to aim for. Um, so that's a bit abstract, but the, um, the question you know, in, by nature was, is a bit abstract. And I, I think my rough answer to the question is no. Now, of course, it depends on the time frame. You know, let's just assume we have all these amazing quantum computers and there's all these innovations in intelligent systems and the design of them. Yeah, maybe one day we can do more and more things which are considered creative or complex, but there's not a lot that we can do there now. Uh, audience question, how can AI be used to promote the marketing of consumer products via pictures or photos, which also again, it gets into ethical mm. issues in terms of mm. how law enforcement's used it and Mm. Uh, selecting, you know, getting it accurate with white people, but not getting it with accurate with black people. So mm. to their question, just focused on the marketing, 
promote mm-hmm. marketing of consumer products via pictures or photos? You know, so what's your answer to that? Very, very good question. Um, lots of ways. I'll try to restrict it to just a couple of examples that come to mind. But for example, figuring out what people want by what they're already looking at. So you can extract things, features from images that people are looking at over and over again that are really popular, for example, on Instagram. And you could see that images that are really popular have a lot of these colors. So these might be colors that are popular this season or um, uh, this sort of style. So we're in the style of something with short sleeves or long sleeves or they're long or short dresses or, or something like that. So you can probably do a lot around analyzing what people are liking um, on one of these platforms and then figure out, all right, what do they, um, what, what could we maybe produce and market to these, these people that we've analyzed um, or whose behavior we've analyzed. So that's one way. Um, and then there are of course the more sort of prosaic ways, which is just building up profiles of people. So just extrapolating patterns from this from their spending behavior or from their demographic information. You know, people that tend to have these characteristics earn this much money, live in this place, you know, um, spend money on this cadence, you know, have this sort of family situation, tend to buy these products. And, you know, we can do that analysis one table at a time as humans pretty easily in some cases with smaller data sets. But once the data sets become very big and once we're trying to do like a multifactorial thing, like try to figure out a really um, deep profile of someone. It's sort of hard to do that in our head. So AIs can be useful for that. Audience question, what steps do you put in place to account for correlation versus causation? Mm, Very good question because um, in a way, um, but in another way, it's a very easy question to answer because most AI is actually just correlative. And it's got no causal um, information in it at all. And that is, you know, a lot of AI is just doing a lot of derivations and descending down to, you know, a, a, a result and doing lots of correlations and figuring out, okay, when this happens, does that happen? And figuring out, okay, most of the time, this is, this is going to correlate with that. And so we're going to make a recommendation that whenever you see, you know, um, this image, you should present, or whenever you see, sorry, this behavior, you should present this offer to buy this thing. Um, so most of AI operates that way. Not a lot of AI operates in the way of um, a human going, all right, when you see this, do that, and then just running over and over again. That's sort of not a self-learning system. That's just a rules-based system. Um, so in a sense, you don't have to put in a system like this that sort of tells you when something's correlative or causative. Um, I think where people go wrong and why it's a good question is they imply something from the results of a self learn system. And, you know, that's where you just have to be careful and diligent about um, sort of figuring out what a system is really telling you. Audience question, how would you explain the difference between AI versus deep learning algorithms is this a key component of AI or is deep learning a distinctive uh, SW category of its own? Yeah, I think what they mean there by SW is software just for everyone else's benefit. Might be wrong. Um, yeah. So uh, deep learning is sort of a sub subset of artificial intelligence. You know, if we can think of artificial intelligence as a general field of trying to figure out how to create systems that learn, if you define intelligence as the ability to learn um, and you want to figure out how to learn faster, AI is the field of figuring out how we can learn faster on an artificial substrate, not our own substrate in our brain, something else like a computer. So that's what AI is. And then, you know, there are lots of different methods we've developed to learn things on an artificial substrate. And some of those methods are what we call machine learn methods. Some of those methods are causal methods. Some of those methods are just statistical methods that um, don't learn in the same way as machine learned methods. And some of the machine learned methods are based on our understanding of neural networks, our own brains, and some of the neural network methods. So this is what I mean by sub category are deep as in there are lots of layers to them. There's one layer that sort of figures out one thing. 
passes the lesson on to the next layer, it figures out another thing and so on and so forth. And when there are many, many layers, we call it a deep neural network and people just come to call that deep learning. So that's your, your sort of two minute explanation. But of course, there are a lot of fantastic books that explain this very well. How much did the AI play a role in reducing the time it took to come up with the COVID cure? Mm. So obviously it's hard to tell from the outside. Um, and I wish we had a cure, by the way, um, yeah. with the vaccine or the vaccines. Yeah, um, I, sh I should have said vaccine, sure. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just expressing a sentiment that I think we all wish there was a cure at this point. Yeah. Um, so look, it's hard to tell. Um, I will say as a total outsider, right? I don't work at Moderna or any of these companies. I don't have any inside information about them. As an outsider, you can see it very much contributing to the process of narrowing down the potential solutions. And this is what AI has been pretty good at in the development of drugs and vaccines in general. And then specifically, as I understand, with the COVID vaccine, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And that is, you know, you can give it lots of different approaches and just go, all right, go and figure out if these chemicals basically attack this, this substance, this virus, this bacteria, this whatever. Um, and you can program in some knowledge of like how things, how chemicals typically affect other chemicals and just let it go and run. Um, so it's good at narrowing down the solutions, basically. I think where AI has been underrated and underanalyzed in terms of its impact on um, the vaccine effort broadly is more on the supply chain. And that is, you know, getting the drugs out there, getting them tested really quickly in bioreactors, for example, um, and making those things run really efficiently, getting them on trucks, figuring out how, you know, we're going to get it across like a complex supply chain at a certain temperature and how many of them are going to go bad and where do we need to distribute them, you know, figuring out what communities are um, suffering from like much, much higher infection rates. And so you want to sort of push more vaccines in that direction. There's a lot around the supply chain that's probably more boring to write about in the newspaper, um, but where AI has had, a, has had a real impact, I think. Um, question from the audience. How do you feel about the ethics in AI? Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess, uh, I guess it's less of a feeling and more of a application of a personal point of view because um, that's what ethics are, right? They're frameworks um, in a way. Um, we don't want to get too deep into the, you know, into, into moral philosophy. Um, but ultimately, I, I view AI as a tool and it's just like any other tool, you know, with a stone, you can build a house or you can throw it at someone. And with a hammer, you can hammer in a nail into a barn door or you can hammer a rivet into a tank door. And there's lots of different ways you can apply lots of different tools and some are good and some are bad. And, you know, we really just have to make sure that we are surrounding the people that are building these systems, educating the people that are building, monitoring, using these systems uh, about both their power and also therefore their consequences and just, keep having the discussions we've always had around the use of tools and technology um, to make sure we're using it for good and not bad. And I, I don't think there's anything at this point in time inherently different about artificial intelligence technology to, for example, software or a lot of other you know, machinery or whatnot. Uh, it's just, it just so happens it's a little bit harder to understand and it can, you know, be a little bit more powerful more quickly in some contexts. Um, so that's one thing to say, you know, ultimately it's just a tool. I think the other thing to say is ultimately it's nothing until it's instantiated in the physical world. So it's just code that exists in, you know, not in the ether, but, you know, it just, it's just code until it's encoded on something in the physical world, like a drone or like a car. And, you know, therefore, there's a juncture at which we can control its instantiation in the physical world, and we should.
I think, moral, speaking morally in terms of the use of the word should, control it at that point because you know it can have an impact at that point, and so we can put restrictions on it and whatnot there. It all depends on whose hands it's in and what their intentions are at the end of the day. Dynamite was made to save people and it's turned out uh, bad and good, like everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, question from the audience. Isn't the, isn't the fact that AI mainly lacks semantics uh, slash meanings a major constraint? Pattern matching is not the same as meaning-based uh, mm -hmm. processing. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> That's a very good but very involved question. Um, and you could, you, the short answer to the question is yes, I think it is a huge constraint. The long answer to the question is, well, it depends. And it's a question of degree is in, you know, you can program some semantic understanding into AI. And I'm sorry to those in the audience who don't really know what I'm talking about here, what the question is asking. It's a bit hard to sort of define every term in that question and then go through it in a short amount of time. So I'll just engage with the question as directly as I possibly can without defining everything around it. But the short answer is yes, it's a constraint. The long answer is depends in that you can program some, you can have some semantic understanding in a model and a self learning system today. And there's some promise that AI can actually derive meaning, especially with some of the newer models that can sort of analyze very long sequences of text and things like that. So it's a constraint, but I think a lot of people are working on relaxing that constraint um, for self-learning systems. I have to say, uh, I think the people who developed this are brilliant. And, mm. you know, when you're able to go and talk into your phone, even that, and it mm. translates it into text, it uh, amazes me. And uh, the next question for, oh, by the way, what do you think? Are we in the first inning of the nine inning game here or, or <laughs> are we with AI? Like, is this just the very beginning? Yeah, I really do. I really do think we're in the first inning. You know, in the book, I say we're just, you know, partway through the AI first century in that we started developing AI about 50 years ago, but now is when it's really coming into the real world. It's been a lot of research work for the last 50 years, and it's been in fits and starts too, um, based on funding and based on interest and applications. But now we're getting to the point where all of the substrates are there. You know, we've got powerful computers, we've got a lot of data, we've got really powerful models um, or methods to learn on those that com computational substrate on computers that are sort of like a lot of the methods we use to learn. And you know, we're getting to the point where this is could be really, really useful. Um, and I think you know, we're just starting to apply it in so many industries. And there are so many more where we could apply it if certain research paths pay off. So I am, um, yeah, I'm uh, really quite excited about what's gonna happen in the rest of the AI first century. I had once worked for the chairman of Senate Corps back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. and he said, we're not a biotech company, we're an information technology company that focuses mm -hmm. on biotechnology. And he was saying back in the early 90s, wait till you see what artificial yeah. intelligence does to reducing the time for drug development from 10 years to a few years. And yeah. he turned out to be right 30 years later. Uh, as yeah. we've seen in what the vaccine, how quickly they were able to come up with the vaccine. Uh, yeah. Question from the audience. As an investor, what aspects of AI-focused startup you would look at to make decisions? <laughs> that's, um, that's a tough one to answer, right? Because it's, it's like asking anyone, like, how do you do your job? And, uh -huh. you know, ask anyone from a barber to a cook or whatnot, and uh, they'll say, all right, well, have you got 10 years to be my apprentice? Um, so that's my, that's the background, I guess. It's, it's hard to say like how I do my job um, because it's, it involves so many different little elements. I guess the thing about the way I practice my craft of investing that's different to other investors is the bit around AI. And a lot of that bit I've actually just, written up in the book so that includes things like um statistics and metrics you can look at to figure out if an ai model is working is the prediction accurate in what cases in what cases is it in what cases is it not is the prediction over time actually getting less accurate 
because it's drifting from reality, like the underlying data changed or the way the system it's trying to model change. Um, what's the price impact of this um, degree of automation that this, this system, this AI system is allowing? Um, you know, what is the resulting impact on strategy? So if you can reduce your prices, does that mean you can capture more of the market? So they're the ways I um, analyze a company that are a bit different from other investors. And I think, um, you know, I tried to put a lot of those in the book so people can understand them because they're not just useful for investors. You know, when you think about it, everyone is a capital allocator. Like if you're running a small team, you're allocating the time of that team. If you're running a family business, you're allocating the cash you have to try to figure out how to grow. If you're running a startup, you're allocating the proceeds of the funding that you've raised to try to get to the next level and try to get some more funding from someone. So, you know, we've all got to make really good decisions every day about where we invest and do you buy, in the context of an AI first company, it's about, do you buy more data? Do you hire more people? Do you spend more money on computers so that they can run the models more and hopefully they just get better when you run them more? Um, so I tried to put a lot of those models in the book for that reason. A question from the audience. What have you noticed being, uh, being common barriers to entry for a company integrating AI solutions into their current environment? Hmm. Um, it's a really good question. And I know where this question is going and I'll get to that. But the first thing I want to say is the most common barrier I see and the reason I wrote this book is to break through this barrier is just vocabulary in that someone in the company gets it Someone gets that AI is going to be powerful. Someone gets that there's an application of it today, but they can't articulate it to someone or they can, but then that other person doesn't know what words they're using. And so can't also appreciate how powerful it can be. Or they can't articulate it, not just with words, but with numbers. They can't show, well, if we do this, if we make this prediction, we'll be able to earn more money in this way. And over time, it'll just get better and better because you know you can you can sort of draw this out on the back of the envelope. And so I wrote the book to try to give people those words to try to say, like, you know, AI gives us a, a little bit of a learning effect. There's a data network effect, and like be able to use those terms you know, very easily in a strategy conversation can be really helpful in getting other people on board and give them metrics. So that's um, often the biggest barrier. There are lots of other barriers though, of course. You know, one is, look, it might require a little bit of capital investment to hire someone to buy some data or something like that. Um, another barrier might be data infrastructure is just really poor, as in the way you're currently storing your data is a little bit, um, a little bit lacking. You know, it doesn't have proper labels on it or it's not organized in tables the right way so that you can just grab a machine learning model off the shelf and sort of run your data through it. You've got to clean that up a lot. That can be a huge barrier. Um, so there, there are lots of other barriers, but I think really the main one, like with a lot of digital transformation efforts, I guess, is vocabulary. Um, good news is somebody through listening to the show, watch your book and right. finding it very helpful and practical as a founder Thank of you, Stage AI startup. Uh, they'd love any advice on how to get potential customers to share their, and we have to have this one of our questions, uh, mm. to share their non-personal data with us. Yeah. How do, you, how do you do that? Yeah. So I'm guessing this is in the context of a company selling a B2C product, right. selling a consumer product, a B2B product's a bit different. You know, it's all about incentives, right? You know, and a lot of the incentives around the products we use today that actually use a lot of our uh, non-personal and sometimes personal data are a little bit fuzzy, but sort of obvious enough. So it's obvious enough when you flick through a menu on Netflix that you're going to get or watch movies on Netflix or reject a recommendation, you're going to get a slightly better recommendation next time. It's obvious enough that when you're signed into Google, you get better results than when you're not signed into Google. And I think, you know, the bar is sort of low now, thanks to those companies in that, you know, people just like roughly sort of get that if they're signed in contributing data, you know, in a very um, sort of unintentional way, they're, they're going to get better results from using the product. Um, so that is, uh, 
That, that's, I guess, some words, there, I guess, some words of encouragement. In the book, though, I have a lot more tactical ways to do this, which is um, inclusive of things like developing a special app that collects data for one thing, but you can actually use it for something else or providing an incentive, you know, a give to get model. If you sign up and share this data, we'll give you this service for free. Credit Karma is a company like that, right? You get a free credit report, but you give them a lot of information um, in a way. So, um, you know, there's a whole list of things in the book. And this is actually one of the most surprising things about writing this book and that I ended up sort of spending about half of the book talking about all of these interesting ways to get data, whether it's from consumers or from companies. You know, I, I thought it's a great book for leaders. So they had mm -hmm. some kind of working knowledge ab about and encourage them to invest in AI. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's one of the great things about your book. You, you, you make us just dangerous enough that we won't say, you know, we ought to really invest in this thing. And here's my questions mm -hmm. uh, related to it. And now they've had some uh, e explanation for mm -hmm. uh, all the different things they're thinking about question from the audience, are the methods and algorithms of AI generally decades old, but they've only been recently adopted because we now have the computing power to usefully apply them? I guess that's the 50 mm. year overnight success you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a great question. The short answer is yeah. Um, a lot of the methods we're using today are built on or are just directly direct applications of directly applicable um, versions of research that was done quite a while ago. Now, in a sense, that's true. In another sense, you know, at the moment we're standing on the shoulders of giants as in you know, some of the really cool stuff people may have seen recently in the press around processing really large volumes of text with things called transformer models have been um, a result of taking stuff we already knew, combining it with some other stuff we already knew, and then running it on a computer that we've never had, like a much more powerful computer. So it's sort of any and all, you know, a lot of what we use today, yes, the fundamental understanding behind it, the fundamental design of it is actually pretty old, um, but we just didn't have enough data or computing power to use it, but now we do. So it's all come together, as I was saying before. How much are hackers using AI in order mm. to infiltrate and how much are we using AI to defend, you know, throw the moats mm. and, and, and walls up mm. to protect ourselves? So where does AI play a role in both mm. of the offense and defense here? Yeah, um, in a big way. And in a sense, if it's, being using for, if it's being used for offense, you sort of have to use it for defense. So, you know, there's the real world version of this, which is in systems that, you know, detect enemies and then either defend against or attack various enemies or opponents. Um, so you can think of drone-based systems and aircraft-based systems, um, land-based systems. You can think of all that sort of stuff. And then there's the sort of bits before there's some sort of theater of war. So there's analyzing huge volumes of information from you know, online forums for uh, or Twitter or something like that to see what people are talking about and where people might be sort of inst uh, instantiating some sort of negative sentiment um, against us, um, us or them, or however you want to phrase it, whatever side you're on. Um, so it's being used all over the place. Um, you know, we also see it in the corporate context, not just in the military context as well as in AI can be used to figure out different ways to get into systems, to try lots of different approaches. And AI can also be used to defend against lots of different approaches to sort of learn the behavior of people trying to hack a system and then like preempt the next way they're gonna try and get in, you know, whether it's through a network access point or something like that. Um, so yeah, I can go on and on, but um, it's, it's being used very extensively and in like a pretty scary way. Do you share Elon Musk? This is a question from the audience. Do you mm -hmm. share Elon Musk's sentiments that AI is potentially more dangerous than nukes? Because Absolutely not. Managed. I mean, that Absolutely is empirically not. just, it's, it's empirically just wrong. Um, nuclear weapons have killed so many people. Their power to kill lots of people is absolutely immense. They could kill everyone on the planet immediately if, if something really bad happens. You know, they're really, really, really big threat. 
AI cannot do that today. Um, this is a really stupid throwaway comment that I think takes the focus away from nuclear non-proliferation, which is a really still a really important thing for the world to consider. Uh, what are the skills which, which you list are many in the book and costs needed to start an AI initiative that is impactful? Because you said even small companies could uh, do this. And I think we always think of it mm -hmm. as a large um, company tool. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the schools and uh, what are the skills and uh, mm -hmm. costs to do an AI project? Yeah, I content. mean, you know, I really encourage people to start small in the book and start with statistics. And so, you know, what that means in terms of skills and costs are, in a lot of the skills you need to do a little bit of data science, which is, you know, the precursor to or, or form of often machine learning, are just um, basic statistical or programming or mathematical skills. And a lot of people in your company may already have them and they just need to be given the time and space and the encouragement to experiment, um, excuse me, with AI. So in a lot of those skills are already there in your company. You don't need to hire anyone. You don't need to do anything special. And then the costs, you know, today they're so low. You know, you can get pre-trained models. So models that already work to recognize a whole bunch of stuff in images or understand what someone's saying in an audio file um, from some of the big companies. And you can play around with them for free. You can um, get software from these big companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and others that allows you to sort of run data science experiments um, up to a certain level for free, you know, without paying for all this computing time. Um, and there's also a lot of free data out there in the public domain, a lot of data on things like, um, you know, usage of government services all the way through to consumer behavior patterns, all the way through to economic statistics. There's a lot of like big public data sets out there that you can use. You know, Kaggle, a company I invested in when we sold uh, quite a while ago is the biggest community of data scientists and machine learners in the world, but also has a whole section of the website with public data sets that you can play around with and maybe even incorporate into your own processes and use to make your own predictions. Uh, can you explain the concept of lean AI? Because I think people are very familiar mm -hmm. with um, the lean startup and you mm -hmm. even talk about the differences in your book, but can you explain mm -hmm. the concept of lean AI? Yeah, um, in a sense, it's similar in that, you know, the idea is to ask a set of really good questions to narrow down the problem you're solving. And so the idea is to try to figure out what are we really trying to predict here? And what do we think is the business impact of making this prediction? And then after you ask a series of questions around that, um, you know, what, are, what, are, what would be impactful for us and what is possible for us? You can narrow in on one experiment to run on one data set on one computer that has one output with one report. And then with that output, you can go, all right, we were able to make this prediction to this degree of accuracy. And if we just buy a bit more data or run the experiment again, you know, spend a bit more money on computing, or you know, maybe hire a consultant to give us an idea about how to model this problem differently, we might get better results. And so it helps you make that next capital allocation decision referencing an answer before. Um, but anyway, that's the overview of Lean AI. The actual steps involved are, are all in the book. Uh, why are you against selling the data harvested? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, data is one of your core assets and one of the three components of the data learning effect that um, AI first companies, you know, are ostensibly trying to build. And if you sell that data, you sort of give someone else the opportunity to build a self-learning system based on that data and make the prediction that could be really good for your business. So um, it's just a, it's a nuanced consideration. You know, maybe you can sell some of the data, maybe not, but the point is you really wanna be the one with the predictive edge. And what gives you that predictive edge is a combination of data and models and um, if you sell the data, you sort of, you may have, maybe not, given away some of that edge. Um, question from the audience. What's the most surprising use of AI that you've seen? Oh, I mean, there's just so many. I see them every day. Um, uh, let me think. 
Um, I'm always surprised when we discover something about a natural system, you know, our bodies, the environment or something like that using AI. You know, when AI just sort of sees something a totally different way to us, you know, understands how a fire might move through um, a forest or understands, you know, why a certain condition is popping up in a certain population. And you know, it just gives us a clue. It's not always going to actually understand how that happened, you know, wh why a certain condition um, is actually sort of a virus is actually morphing in a certain way, but it can give us some really good clues. And so I'm always surprised when that happens because, you know, AIs don't start with knowledge of how these systems work. Um, what's the biggest things that can go wrong and how do you guard against it? Um, well, it depends on the application, right? There's nothing inherently that goes wrong about code executing on a computer. Um, so I don't know, it depends if you're making a diagnosis and you get the diagnosis wrong, the person could get more sick rather than better. Um, you could give them a drug that's going to harm them rather than help them. So it, that's an extreme example, but yeah, it just really depends. I think the point of the question is, you know, what monitoring system should we think about putting in place? Right. And the book has a whole chapter on this because it's really, really important. And that is, it's really important to have systems that understand when models move away from, you know, what they are originally predicting, when the data underlying changes, when you know, something about the application changes, when it gets an input that it didn't expect. You know, there are lots of different systems you can put in place to make sure that you, know, you don't ultimately rely on a prediction that's a bad one um, when the model might originally have been putting out good ones. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a whole, whole chapter in the book about that. Uh, where do you think AI is underutilized? That's a question from Everybody. the audience. <laughs> absolutely everywhere you know we could be using it to automate so much more of what we do we all do tedious tasks you know whether we're in high level positions or low level positions you know answering the same email over and over again or sorry the, uh, the little light went off there there we go answering um the same email over and over again or doing the same accounting reconciliation or um you know filling out the same form you know, we all do these things over and over again every month and they are so tedious and AI can automate a lot of them actually. Um, on question from the audience, what type of AI and how would you use AI to draw a million audience today at the show? So how could I draw a million people to listen to you using AI? Good question. Um, you probably start with some sort of really hard problem like getting a language model to understand who's asking questions about AI online on Twitter or whatnot, and then using a system um, to contact those people and then sending them a link to the show. The first part of that's really hard. The last part's a little bit easier. So this is uh, our last question and we thank mm -hmm. you so much for spending the time today. And mm -hmm. I, I encourage everybody to get this book. I mean, it's a really insightful thank book you. about AI and you've done a great job of explaining complex uh, issues related to it. What are the, and we have a lot of entrepreneurs who mm -hmm. listen to this show and angel investors. What are mm -hmm. the best entrepreneurial opportunities in AI? Yeah, honestly, they're the ones closest to you as in, you know, for any one person, I'll, I'll try to narrow this down because you know, there's so many in a general sense, but the, the best ones are the ones that are right in front of you. And it's, you know, what have you done over and over again that you know how to do really well, whether it's stitch a sole to a shoe or whether it's, you know, put a top on a bottle cap or whether it's um, produce a really nice graph. What do you know how to do really, really well that you've done over and over again and figure out how to put that into a system that can then execute that over and over again, the intelligent system. That's the best opportunity. You know, what do you know how to do that's valuable to a lot of people and automate it and then sell that automation to people. That's it. We have 60 seconds for this one last question from the audience. Do you agree that most human-centered use for AI is one that allows anyone to describe what they want in their own way of thinking and then generates pristine code? Mm -hmm. mm. I don't think that's the most human-centered use, but I think it's a really, really good one. 
and will actually maybe accelerate the adoption of AI more than anything we've talked about. So it's a really good idea. Ash, thanks uh, so much for taking the time. Please be careful on your bike. Uh, the audience sure. didn't get to see all the scratches you had from a, a bike fall <laughs> today, but we appreciate that you were able to play through it and be on today. And best of yeah. luck with your book. And we thank hope you. we'll have you on again. Maybe you'll write another book. Yeah, I hope so. And thank you so much to everyone for the questions. There were some really good ones in there and feel free to contact me, Ash Fontana, Twitter, Gmail, whatnot, anytime with more of them. Sounds great. Enjoy your weekend. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.